Oof, freezing. Hello, everybody. Let me know when you get into the live stream. Just setting up now. We're just waiting for them to begin. I'm going to get it up on my phone so I can see what you guys are saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, we did. Oh, we got one person in here. What's going on? It says one on the chat. I see three of you, though. What's up, guys? Oh, yeah, baby. We're just waiting for it to start. Freezing. Yo, I see you now. I see you. Got you guys up. I see you guys. What are you guys saying? I'm waiting for all the comments to pop up. It's a bit slow. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, guys. Oh, man. It's been a crazy day in the market. Crazy day in the market. For bingo. But yeah. Oh, no. Don't die, baby. Don't die. Don't die on me, baby. Oof. It's been tough, but I've just been, uh, I'm holding, but I'm managing to also average down because, hey man, yeah, the share price is falling. It's falling like crazy. Did anyone pick up some more shares? Or are you waiting still? Oh, we starting. They're getting funky. Let me turn them down for now. Yeah, got the little background music. One sec, guys. I'm going to get ready. Let me switch it over so I can see it. Yeah, the share price has been crazy. It's been dropping. I saw some people sold today as well. Um, but I'm trying to buy more, to be honest, because my average is quite high. Just getting you guys up on here. Uh -uh. Bam, bam. Okay, we got 18 people in here, 19 people. Sweet man. Yeah, so have a, how's everyone been feeling today? How have you guys been behaving as well? Um, have you been picking up shares or what's your average? Are you guys sitting on your hands at the moment? Average is eight pounds seventeen. Okay, he's a he's a he's from the UK. He's got the pounds up, baby. No, it hasn't started yet. It hasn't started yet. Your average is about the same as mine. I think mine's around about the ten dollar range now. Oh, Kevin's got the four fifty, baby. Yeah, some people who are early adopters, they're still sitting at fifty cents. Um, some of them, you know, sixty cents, seventy cents, one dollar, and they've just been holding through this. But um, I've been averaging down at the moment. Of a bombshell statement at this point. What is an example of a bombshell statement at this point, respectfully? I see your average is now. It's all popping up. You got $7 there. You guys have got lower than mine. Are you attempted? Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Not financial advice. I can't tell you to buy, sell or hold a stock. But um, for me, I just continue uh, to want to buy it. And I'm basically trying to find some more work at the moment in which I can earn so I can buy some more shares because um, I'm long term on, on buying an genomics and I can wait. Oh, yeah. I see you, baby. I see you. I saw some of the boys telling me that they were they were waiting to see if it's going to come down a bit more. Um. But yeah, some of them are actually looking to to buy a lot more. Seven sixty, baby, juicy, long. I'm I'm really interested to see what institutions are actually gonna um, buy. We'll find out in forty five days or so. But I'll, I'm interested to see which institutions um, buy and when they put in their thirteen F form forty five days later from today, who actually bought at this price. 
Holding long and strong, Tess. Long and strong. Oh, Mr. Kai, baby. Mr. Kai in the house, baby. Two ninety nine. Yeah. Today I was actually um, looking at also Nano Dimension. I was looking at Coinbase and I was seeing what Ark was buying and selling. So that video is going to come later. Um, but it's interesting what big money is doing, you know, with some retail investors selling out now, um, our institutions now going to enter because they're seeing, you know, a better value point. And I want to see what do institutions actually value a uh, buy nanogenomics at? Because we can see our analysts, some of the analysts are like putting up $15, $14 for the end of year, 12 months. Yeah, you on the party bus, baby. It was early. Shout out to the Full Bull podcast as well. I went on a podcast earlier today. Long term, baby. Um, not financial advice, obviously, entertainment only. But um, I believe a hundred dollars. But it's gonna be, you know, a long, a long journey, a long road to adoption. But I'm gonna be holding this for for many years. I can wait five to eight years for this stock. For the beginning, can you guys hear? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bryn Leakey. I'm from the Columbia University Medical Center in New York. And I do want to thank the ACMG for selecting this presentation uh, and for allowing us to share what I consider to be kind of exciting results from this multi-center trial. I have no financial disclosures pertinent to this presentation. The first thing to do is get right into optical mapping. It is a new technique, which I don't think many people are aware of. And it is a novel approach that directly visualizes ultra-long DNA molecules in the native state. Consensus assemblies are, accurate, are then used to accurately call structural variation between samples in the human reference genome on a genome-wide scale. And importantly, it's about a thousand times more sensitive in its resolution compared to uh, karyotype analysis. That makes it very well suited for mapping complex balanced rearrangements, getting their breakpoints, and also looking at very complicated structural abnormalities. So how does it work? First thing to do is extract long DNA molecules. And this is a extraction procedure that's very different to the ones we used to for routine molecular biology. It does require us to get very long, ultra long DNA molecules. These long molecules are then directly labeled and stained at specific sequence motifs, which are indicated in this illustration with those green uh, signals. Label DNA is then loaded onto the chip and instrument, and the DNA is linearized as it moves through a nanochannel array. I'll show you some animations in a few slides. So here we see the free DNA right on the bottom left, and it starts off in its native state, which is a Gaussian coil. It then, as it moves through the array, becomes elongated, and it's, it basically becomes linearized, until it goes through the nano channel as a single DNA molecule. That's what it looks like. So it starts off on the left in its Gaussian state, and as it goes through the, uh, the array, it goes to the microchannels first, then these pillars, all forcing the DNA into a single-stranded state until it enters the nano channels, which look like that. And ultimately, yeah, you can see what the DNA strands look like this is a, a large version and here you can actually appreciate the labeled motifs um on the as the green signal in this illustration you take the raw image data and you convert them to digital molecules and then this becomes a lot like ngs where we do uh, aggregation and assembly using consensus genome maps and just to show you what that looks like so in these illustrations, the patient DNA is going to be in blue, as you see at the bottom. And what you're going to do is align them to the reference exactly at the matching motifs. Now you can see the one on the left matching to the reference, in this case, chromosome 5, the one on the right matching to another portion of it. Uh, and you see this region missing. 
I've done some digital imaging. In fact, that DNA molecule was just one long continuous strand. And so when you map it, you can clearly see that it maps to everywhere but this region, which is actually deleted in your patient and present in the reference. So it does give you the ability to map both DNA losses and gains. And you can see the full uh, kind of repertoire of what you can get from optical mapping, gains and losses, insertions. You can see copy number changes from repeat array expansions as well as tandem duplications. And then we start to get into the more exciting aspect, which basically sets it apart from chromosomal microarrays, where you can start to see balanced events like translocations and like inversions. So the aims of this multi-center study was to evaluate the clinical diagnostic capabilities of optical mapping in cancer patients that have acute myeloid leukemia. This was a blinded study where we compared the results that were generated by uh, additional cytogenetics in a clear laboratories, and then we compared those results to the results that we saw from the optical genome mapping. The primary hypothesis was that we would get results in a single assay from optical mapping that were concordant with those achieved using multiple gold standard technologies. And the secondary hypothesis is that we would start to see null cytogenomic aberrations that ultimately we hope will provide further insight into the pathogenicity of certain cancers, in this case, AML. And certainly this does lay the groundwork for multiple future studies, not only in myeloid leukemias, but in any type of other cancer. The samples for the study were peripheral blood or bone marrow samples, primarily from patients um, at diagnosis. So we had 100 patients in this cohort who were subsequently treated using intensive chemotherapy. All of them had routine testing involving carrier typing. In 19 cases, they also had additional fish tests. And three of those cases, in three cases, you had chromosomal microarray analysis that was also performed. All patients were recruited under IRB protocols that were approved at each institution. For assessment of clinical utility, um, we looked at concordance with clinically significant structural variants or copy number variants that were reported by our clear cap approved laboratories using routine cytogenomic testing. And then we set out to look for additional clinically significant SVs and CNVs that were not identified by routine testing. With the novel technology, we anticipated and we certainly did find a whole lot of extra uh, findings. But what we wanted to do was really review them for clinical significance. So we further filtered them for overlap with AML specific genes and AML specific fish probe locations. We then curated them. So we had our own internal expert panel that reviewed all the additional findings after filtering. And the final list of additional SVs and CNVs were compiled based on two tiers of clinical significance. One, identification of one or more aberrations that are used in the ELN 2017 risk stratification system or those that change the ELN risk status. We looked um, further identified abnormalities that may not necessarily be specified in ELN 2017, but for which we have additional and what we deem as suffi uh, sufficient information from published data that demonstrates clinical significance. All SVs and CNVs that we deem to be clinically significant were in fact uh, confirmed by orthogonal methods uh, either long-range PCR uh, or Sanger, or in some case, microarray analysis. So getting into results, we stratified um, the cytogenomic results into five categories, negative carrier type, aneuploidy or partial aneuploidies, translocation or inversion, translocation or inversion uh, with anisomy, and then complex abnormalities, including uh, involving more than three abnormalities. So this is a complicated table, but the thing to focus on is really that green line for each of the categories. You can see that optical mapping showed 100% concordance. If we 
look at uh, more granular results, an exciting finding is that we saw uh, clinically relevant SVs and CNVs in 11% of cases that had actually been missed by routine methods. And two of the nine cases were, in fact, uh, complex. Two of the 25 were from translocational inversions. And excitingly, three cases that were originally deemed to be normal by cytogenetics were in fact reclassified as being translocation events. Uh, and these involve cryptic rearrangements and I'll show you them in a few slides. Additionally, optical mapping refined the underlying genomic structure reported by traditional cytogenetics in another 13% of cases. If we focus on abnormal carrier types, we see that 15.4% um, of them uh, that had cytogenetically abnormal carrier types, optical mapping revealed clinically significant new events. And again, if I go back to the normal carrier types, as a proportion of the normal carrier types, it's 6.25% of cases reported with normal carrier types were shown to have cryptic translocations involving gene fusions, two of which involved NSD1 and NUP98. And then if we go back to all the other things that we saw, in the abnormal carrier types, 40, just over 40% of them, optical genome mapping better characterized the genomic aberrations by refining the structural breakpoints and identifying unknown cytogenetic elements like marker chromosomes and derivative chromosomes. The impact on 2017 ELN uh, category, we saw a change in two patients, uh, one where there was an upgrade from intermediate to adverse, and in the second one, actually a downgrade from intermediate to favorable. There were no other changes in ELN risk stratification, um, but what you will note is that we have four cases involving cryptic rearrangements, um, you know, NSD1 and MECOM and RUNCS1. Uh, we did see a simple carrot type with an abnormal 7P. That was 17P that was upgraded uh, to complex carrier type, but optical genome mapping revealed that it was in fact balanced um, with a 117 uh, translocation, but there was not a 17P deletion. So no TP53 TP deletion. There was one case with a classic A21 translocation uh, that looked like it was a standard runs, uh, you know, one fusion, but in fact, we saw a cryptic um, 5-4, a 4-5 uh, translocation, and there, in fact, was a deletion at the, you know, 8 q 21 uh, breakpoint. Um, and in terms of the derivative 5, that was particularly relevant as the loss of 5-Q could possibly lead to changes in patient management and prognosis if confirmed to be in a separate clone. And then in addition, uh, with respect to that uh, focal deletion uh, of that portion of RUNX1, uh, uh, T1, you know, that really creates a novel fusion and the significance is, is really uncertain at this time, but it, the fusion predicted by routine testing certainly would not have been accurate. This is what it looks like on cytogenetics, where you can see the classic A21 translocation. It's very hard to, in fact, see in this character whether or not this is the one that has the cryptic rearrangement because the banding is really at 400 band level uh, or whether or not, um, you know, it is a clone that does not contain it. Certainly you can see the 821 rearrangement by optical mapping. You may be able to even see that focal deletion, um, but what you should appreciate is this cryptic rearrangement of 4-5. And on microarray, you can actually see that the regions that were swapped why it's imbalanced, even uh, why it's cryptic, even because it's a large translocation, is that the regions that are involved are almost identical in size. And we know at the 400 band level, you know, those, uh, the distal bands of four and five are very similar. You can even see the focal deletion that was identified. Um, so there were three uh, cryptic translocations involving gene fusion partners that, that were missed, two cases with NUP98, in one case with MECOM, these abnormalities are not yet included in the ELN risk uh, criteria, but there is growing evidence in the literature suggesting that adverse outcomes are associated with these abnormalities. And hopefully, you know, OGM has the potential to, uh, you know, identify, uh, you know, novel findings that may be included in future revisions uh, to the risk stratification. 
Uh, excitingly, you can identify cases uh, potentially eligible for clinical trials, and they, these were two cases with a NUP98, as well as two cases involving 11223 breakpoints uh, involving KMT2A. And it goes without saying that there are multiple clinical trials um, that are available for favorable rearrangements. So in summary, we found that optical mapping identified clinically relevant yeah, SVs and CNVs in 11% of cases that had been missed by routine methods, 6.25% uh, of normal cases, and 15.4% of abnormal cases, and another 13% you got better stratification of the exact rearrangements. Um, then it leaves open a big uh, section where you potentially could see uh, future markers or additional findings that we could track for MRB. So it is a novel new technology for looking at copy number. Uh, there is great concordance with traditional methods, uh, and we do get clinically additional clinically relevant information. And the exciting thing is about its discovery. As I said, the ability to potentially have new novel markers for tracking MRV. We need to look at recurring abnormalities, look at its prognostic value and therapeutic value, and that's going to be all uh, with long-term collaboration with our technicians. So I do want to thank and acknowledge uh, my collaborators. This was a fantastic collaboration, and I really am grateful for all the work that they did uh, to achieve these results. Thank you. I wonder if there's a Q&A. My on? name is Emily Farrow, and I would like to thank the ACG committee for the opportunity to present our research. And today I'll be discussing the clinical application of long-read sequencing in unsolved rare disease. Oh, and as a disclosure, I am a member of an Illumina advisory panel. The Genomic Medicine Center at Children's Mercy Hospital was one of the first genome centers located wholly within a pediatric institution. And this is out of the recognition that pediatric rare disease is not all that rare. And in fact, we know there are 6,746 genetic inherited diseases, roughly, that are affecting one child in 30 in the United States. They cause one in six children's hospital admissions, and they cause up to 20% of infant deaths. Molecular diagnostic yields by symptom-driven clinical exome sequencing in patients with rare disease really only range from 25 to 35%. And it's been shown that the addition of short-read genomes Hey guys, I'm going to let this run as well, so you guys are free to watch this with me as well. I think I'm going to watch for um, until the end of this session. Sequencing uh, using standard sequencing technologies and integrated informatic approaches, there are multiple remaining analyses challenges. While trio sequencing is powerful and has resulted in the detection of multiple de novo diseases, parents are often not available. This is important. Uh, also for autosomal recessive disease, which account for 21% roughly of our diagnoses. In addition to parental samples, we know that coverage, even coverage throughout the genome, remains challenging, particularly in exome sequencing, but we also can see coverage challenges in PCR-free genomes. We also have repetitive regions within the genomes, including pseudogenes and expansion disorders, and structural variant detection, including deletion, duplication, inversion, and translocations, still can be challenging from short rate sequencing. As a result, on the clinical side, it requires multiple assays, and these can be costly and time consuming, and in the clinical world, are limited to our knowns. And we know that we still have assay donut holes, where one assay's limit of detection does not quite fully overlap with the second assay. Clinically, when we're assessing for non-methylation expression changes, the laboratories are utilizing a number of different methods to uh, detect these changes. Now, in some cases, the algorithm testing algorithm can be very straightforward, such as the use of chromosomes for a suspected aneuploidy. But in other cases, such as neonatal hypotonia, the testing algorithms can be quite more difficult and challenging to employ, deploy. The implementation of copy number variant detection from short-read genome and exome sequencing has allowed for some of these testing modalities to be condensed, but exome sequencing in particular is limited in its ability to detect expansions. Improvements in long-read sequencing or third-generation sequencing, such as HiFi or Oxford nanopore sequencing, offer the potential to capture complex copy number variants, single nucleotide variants, expansions, and inversions simplifying our testing algorithms and offering the potential 
or an increase in diagnostic rates. The continued advancements in next generation sequencing technology, particularly impacting long read sequencing, now make it an attractive solution for addressing these complex sequencing challenges. So in the context of a health system wide genomic medicine program, Genomic Answers for Kids, an enhanced hi-fi sequencing workflow has been integrated into the routine follow-up of unsolved rare pediatric disease. In order to integrate uh, hi-fi sequencing into our genomic medicine program, an initial cohort of 80 genomes were sequenced at 30-fold coverage on the SQL system in collaboration with Pacific Biosciences. We selected trio cases that were negative after exome and genome sequencing before they were sent for this initial cohort analysis. With an eye through sample throughput, the DNA isolation was completed using a Comagic 360 automated instrument. And we employed a novel sample preparation that included the ability to prepare up to 20 samples manually at a time for library preparation. This novel workflow is also, also under development on the Cyclone a system by Perkin Elmer to allow for further automation. In addition to the novel laboratory techniques, um, sequencing alignment has been completed using Build 38 for the, all of our cohort and our ongoing analyses. Variant detection is being completed with deep variant used for single nucleotide variants and indels. What's HAP, which includes phasing of deep variant single nucleotide variant calls, impact biostructural variant or PBSV for structural variant detection. Variant annotation is utilizing two workflows, including anode SV to annotate structural variations and runes, which is a previous established pipeline at the Genomic Medicine Center. And de novo assemblies are performed using HIPIASM. So while our sequencing and analyses are ongoing, we are um, excited to share our initial results. So previously using control healthy genomes, it's been shown that high fi generated genomes have a higher sensitivity and specificity than short read genomes. And our cohort, we saw the same um, results where our hi fi calls had a little bit higher sensitivity and specificity than short read genomes in comparison to an Infinium global screening microarray. In addition to having a little higher analytic sensitivity, we also found that the hi fi genomes recognize about five megabases of structure. Of variant um, that were undetected before in short read. This correlates to about 500,000 single nucleotide variants and in insertion and deletions, and about 40,000 structural variants that were previously undetected with short read technology. When we apply a, a allele frequency filter of 0.01%, this results ultimately in about 150 uh, additional variants that need further annotation or analysis by an expert. Again, with an eye through future throughput, we also wanted to evaluate the coverage that would be required for the program and the parents when we were sequencing. In this case, we took a trio that had been sequenced collectively at 30x, and then we downsampled the trio to determine what level of coverage was needed for the program and parents. And when we looked at that, we found that the best mix for us was to take a minimum of 25x coverage, and we could decrease the coverage on the parents to 15x and still maintain our analytic sensitivity and specificity, allowing for us to streamline our sequencing a little bit. And by also these coverage levels allow us to continue to complete our de novo assembly. As we begin to explore our de novo assemblies, where we're doing de novo assemblies across the trio, what we're finding is that we're identifying additional DNA and gaps in the reference of build 38. Now, most of the non-reference DNA is shared between our samples and between our families, but we do find a small number of unique and more common rare DNA sequences greater than 10 kb in length across each genome. These, uh, these sequences are not called by any current method, including cytogenetics, microarray, or short read genome. And while many of these can be attributed to segmental duplication, some of these are unique sequences, not in segmental duplications, and have been found to contain functioning genes. So establishing our analytic sensitivity and specificity is a critical first step on our march towards implementing this in the clinical testing, but how is this going to impact our diagnostic rates or our testing algorithms 
And we'd like to highlight how we see the potential impact of these with, by using a few cases. So again, as we mentioned, we recognize that trial sequencing is a powerful tool for detecting de novo variants, and, but also for autosomal recessive disease, which is again, still a quite common mechanism. But again, parents are not always available for sequencing for multiple different reasons. So in this case, CMH 1610 is a four-year-old girl who was diagnosed prenatally with hepatosplenomegaly, which persisted after birth. The initial clinical NGS-based testing revealed a single pathogenic variant in NPC1, which causes neiman pick disease type C. And again, parental samples are not available. Subsequent biochemical testing was abnormal, and they were appropriately given a diagnosis of demon pick type, D, type C disease. The patient was then enrolled in our genomic answer for kit program, and short read genome sequencing identified a second intronic pathogenic variant. So now we have two pathogenic variants at MPC1 and a clinical diagnosis of demon pick. However, the phase of this variant, again, still remains unknown. And so because of this, this is one of our initial test cases. Uh, that we submitted for high five sequencing because we assume the variants are in trans, but we've not been able to prove that. When we completed the high five sequencing, we were pleased to see that the haplotypes were quite clearly resolved. So we have the allele, um, first allele on the top and the second allele on the bottom, and the two variants are highlighted in green. Um, because this is spread out a little bit, when we zoom in, we can see quite clearly that our insertion and frame shifts variant is the called on the allele on the left. And we can see that our splice variant, um, single nucleotide variant on the right, is in the second allele, which confirms that these variants are in trans. Now, in this case, we are fortunate enough to have the biochemical testing, which gave us the clinical diagnosing, diagnosis um, very quickly for this family. But in many of our cases, particularly in our rare, very ultra rare or novel diseases, we don't have the luxury of a biochemical test that will allow us to confirm the diagnoses. And so being able to phase the variants will not only help us make diagnoses, but will also help us rule out diagnoses when the variants um, appear in cysts. Another exciting um, aspect of HIFI or third generation sequencing is the ability to not only detect structural variants, but detect their orientation and establish Cowboys. Cowboys, I don't think we're going to see uh, much more of this, but within this session anyway, there was 200, I think there was 209 people, yeah, watching uh, when that guy presented. But yeah, um, BioNano's optical genome mapping the presentation within here with the leukemia studies uh, over. So there's like around four other speakers, I think, after this lady. So yeah, I'm probably going to cut out now and post the video up. But yeah, thank you guys for joining. And uh, if you wanted to watch, uh, just look at the beginning of this. Um, we were the first to present, so just look at the beginning of this video. Oh yeah, baby. Yeah, man. <laughs> she's 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 boring for some people, but yeah. Um, yeah, guys, I'm going to cut out. I'm going to post the video and then get some rest. And I'm going to watch through lots of these um, presentations. And then I'll feed back to you guys and try and summarize. But yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. Thank you very much, James. Hey. Thank you, guys, man. I love and appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you thank you for the donations, people. Really appreciate it. Also, don't forget to check out um, the Full Bull podcast as well. Thank you, guys, man. Thank you. Love and appreciate you guys. Mr. Big Up himself and Regal. Pagod. Yeah, I'm tired. Pagod. Oh, gosh. All right. Peace out, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Wishing you all the best, baby. Mr. Invest a lot. Over and out, baby.